Welcome everyone, welcome to Rethinking Balance Sheets this Friday morning, a beautiful Friday morning, uh, great weather, I had a good jog out there Ravi. Uh, joining me today is Ravi Navaratnam from Sage 3 Capital um, and Ravi, you know, last week we had an engaging uh, conversation uh, with the CEO of the tech uh, technology park in Malaysia um, and we spoke about R&D and the importance of R&D and how, how R&D plays a huge role in terms of driving businesses forward and in fact, galvanizing a nation, you know, or nations. Um, and today, you know, we've, we want to continue that conversation, I think. And today we've, we've, we've taken it one step further, right? So, so where else but Stanford University, uh, where you've got universities that really are the, the forefront at the cutting edge of driving and shaping and creating value for businesses um you know google uh, one of the predominant technology companies in the world like, is you know has has its formation from stanford university um with both sergey and uh, and larry coming from stanford university and doing the phd there um, and we've got many many others that are rooted from uh, that that core in stanford university and today we have paul marker joining us uh, your thoughts uh, ravi before we get paul on the show uh, on, on uh, uh, some of the things we'll be talking about today i, I think uh, I think the pre-show chat already, um, <laughs> you know, we had, we had a pre-chat, uh, pre-show chat, and I think it's just uh, ready to get get on to that show now. Um, I think we're going to have a tremendous show. Uh, we're going to definitely dive deeper. It was very nice to hear what Zolera had to say the other day about what we are trying to do. Um, but I think the if you've ever been to Silicon Valley, I've had the fortunate time to go there a couple of times, a few times actually, and. The buzz around that, and as that, I think Paul mentioned in that pre-chat, was the secret sauce. So, uh, not a cooking lesson, but uh, let's try to learn a little bit about that secret sauce of bringing, uh, triangulating three things. That's the industry, entrepreneurs, and universities uh, together uh, to actually see how that can create huge wealth, like we have, that you mentioned, uh, Google uh, uh, being one of them, yeah? And so let's uh, welcome Paul Marker. Paul Marker is a strategist, an advisor, design thinker, speaker, Parallax, uh, a part of Parallax Global Advisors, uh, formerly with Stanford University. He retired from Stanford last year. And uh, the best part of all, he's also a member of one of uh, our board of directors for Leader Economics. So he's part of the family here. So welcome, uh, uh, Paul, to our show. Um, and uh, as always, you know, we've been talking to a number of folks um, on different things, you know, and, and really the idea behind this show is to look at the balance sheets, right? And to make sense of the balance sheets uh, in, in different ways, in more creative ways, uh, and to tweak it and to enhance it and to uh, enable it and to push it forward and, and get it to basically bring uh, value to each and our, every one of our organizations. So, Paul, welcome to the show. Maybe, Paul, very quickly, you can briefly tell us a bit about yourself and your history. I, I know, I know you, you had a fantastic run at Stanford University, um, pretty much, um, I, I guess, what, 20, 30 years or so of the last uh, uh, few decades have been dedicated to that. T tell us a bit about your background. Sure, thank you uh, bo both for, for having me, a wonderful opportunity. And I'd love to um, maybe share just a, a few things about me first. Uh, one of the sort of, I spent 32 years at Stanford University. I graduated and I never left. I know a good thing when I see it, right? <laughs> and so spent spent quite a bit of time initially in a, building a television business from production assistant, camera operator, editor, uh, all the way to production manager. And then building, a, a actually at the time, was the largest television organization uh, in the Bay Area. Uh, and, and found that it was very difficult to run a television business inside of Stanford. T and I took that television knowledge and started to build professional programs to complement the portfolio that the Stanford Instructional Television Network, now SCPD, has. I, I ran the pro-ed unit. We, we aggregated uh, uh, and ran the graduate offer. And uh, we became one of the largest uh, universities in, in the country delivering professional and executive education and graduate education, as uh, my dog gets a little excited about that. And uh, <laughs> I think one of, the, one of the, the great things is I had the privilege of traveling to KL and uh, just delighted to be back. I can't wait to get back, by the way, so. Fantastic, Paul. Um, so you know, um, I, I know Ravi is very excited uh, to have you, and he's been he's been bugging us to get you on board. Um, maybe maybe we can share a little bit in terms of you know maybe at a macro level. You know, we talked about 
R&D the last couple of weeks uh, in our show, and we've been talking to different leaders that are driving R&D um, in technology specifically and going to deep tech and, and some of these areas. But if you look at Stanford and, you know, and that whole Bay Area and Silicon Valley, um, you, you know, I, I think the foundation is Stanford University, right? I mean, if you think about uh, why it's been successful the last 30, 40 years, um, what's that secret sauce behind Stanford uh, and Silicon Valley? Um, how how has R and D? You know, what what role does R and D play in terms of this this being this valuable asset? And and you know, you know, many times in the balance sheets, right? We don't see R and D, right? It's a spend on the P. You know, sometimes it's a spend. Uh, sometimes we put it in a balance sheet and we we kind of depreciate it. Uh, but it's not really something that it, it's an intangible asset, like to some extent. Um, how how important is it? And and what 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 happened in in Stanford that enabled it to? Uh, 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 really be able to be visibly seen in the success stories of Silicon Valley. Yeah, so I think R&D as it relates to a, a research university, R&D as it relates to a company and trying to build new products and services are com two completely different things. I, I was trying to think a little bit about my experience at Stanford and also my connection with industry. And I talked to a good friend of mine uh, who's a former VC, I, I would say uh, uh, reformed VC, Pe Pedram Mokrian. He's an adjunct faculty member. Um, I know, Roshan, you took a, a course uh, from Stanford with Pedram. Um, and so he, so he talks about a bow tie. Uh, on one side, if you, if you aggregate all the um, research and development funds on an annual basis, um, and that includes universities, you get about $2.13 trillion on the R&D side. And if you look on the capital markets side, uh, all the capital markets probably are valued at about 180 trillion US dollars. And in the middle, the connective tissue taking some of that R&D and creating some capital market uh, outcomes, uh, startups that go IPO and so on, um, is 0.25 trillion of what I will call VC and uh, equity venture investing. So, so it's a relatively small, you think about the 2.13 trillion down, funneling down to, to 0.25 trillion and scaling up to these, these large uh, companies. And, and, and it, just that gives you some sort of macro sense. There is a lot of money uh, investment in, in R&D, and there's a lot in capital markets and a, a very small sort of funnel uh, for this bow tie that, that, uh, that flows through really probably outbound from R&D to, to organizations and companies. In the small, universities are charged with, um, I think the anal best analogy that I can think of is oil fields. You drill a bunch of holes called research and development. Um, sometimes you hit a gusher, <laughs> And there's outcome, uh, great activity. Um, sometimes there is not, and that's okay. If you go to companies, however, um, I remember an executive from a large uh, industrial firm coming to us and saying, listen, we're spending about 7 billion US dollars in research and development over the last three to four years, and we haven't seen a return on that investment. And our board is getting a little upset. We, we have a bit of a problem. The, the way companies think about it is sort of, I'll call it, um, ROE, return on this equity, return on some, some level of investment. But if you start to think about um, it for a moment, the, the universities only have a few ideas that will uh, generate uh, the throughput that will allow venture capitalists to take that uh, to, to the capital markets. The capital markets are also looking to strike gold, but they have a sort of a utility function around that investment. And, and so I, I think it, it's just understanding the landscape in the large, what the large numbers are, and then also in the small, how these individual actors are playing roles. Now, that's, that's I'm going to stop there, get reactions, gauge for questions, and then I can talk a little bit about what, what's happening at Stanford that's a bit unique. Perhaps, sure. Paul, if you can tell us a little bit of that narrow part, what does it exactly entail? I think people have, would have a sense, you know, the money is a grant going to university, that's one side. And then you valued markets on this side, it's side of debt, equity, whatever, it's on the left side. So what's that little knot in that bow? What does that actually entail? Yeah, so so that's that little knot in the bow is the venture capitals. That those are people who are who have an understanding of what's happening in the university markets. And ah. they have they see the opportunity in the capital markets. So so they in other words, um, they can work with faculty and they can view the gusher <laughs> coming. <laughs> 
one of the reasons that Stanford is so successful is, is quite frankly, um, the fact the VCs literally come down from Sand Hill Road. About fifty to sixty percent of the uh, investment venture investment capital is right on Sand Hill Road, which is literally a block from Stanford University. Right. They come down, view lectures, talk to faculty, learn about what the trends and opportunities are. They're looking for the gusher that oil in that oil scenario. The venture capitalists then make some investment to create companies, and they're looking for exits. And they have a keen sense about what it takes to build a team, to think about the throughput, and then to develop that capital market. So that's one pathway. The second pathway that Stanford has been successful, not only by virtue of location with venture capital investment, but also creating this Office of Technology licensing. Um, a good friend of mine, Kathy Koo, uh, created or was responsible for scaling this, uh, this otl.stanford.edu if you want to look it up. And what they did is take promising faculty ideas, which may or may not be the obvious gusher, and connect it very easily through a website. All the possible technologies that have been generated at Stanford, you can easily pop on a website and share what that research is, and even share very quickly terms and contractual obligations around which um, uh, engagements might be fostered with, with companies. So really trying to reduce the overall friction. You don't have to go shopping on the campus if you don't happen to be co-located. You can actually look on this website, and most of that material is, is relatively accessible. However, most of it is not useful to the industry, to, to, to capital markets. That's that's the other obvious truth. I think, uh, Paul, that's never been explained to me as well as you've ever said it. I mean, there's a lot of talk, you know, this is how it works. Um, I think yeah, I think you've, in a minute, you probably uh, cleared up a lot of cobweb, at least in my brain. <laughs> um, thanks for that. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, we're getting a lot of reactions from people, uh, uh, the audience. So I, I, I know we usually take this much later, but I thought maybe we should jump in uh, and get some of the audience reaction. So um, uh, Husni says, morning, gentlemen. One question to Paul Marker. R&D is traditionally regarded as cash burn. Um, at which point would a business know when to stop burning? How would R&D be practical for financial institutions? Yeah, it, 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 it's a great question. I think this is part of the tension that I articulated at the at the outset. Companies are looking at a return on investment, uh, a return on equity, and and it does it does very much feel like a cash burn. I think one of the things that um, it's really important to remember is what. First of all, you have to take care of your core business. But what? But companies that do not invest. In, in a future state, especially in, in, um, in the financial sector, are going to be really in trouble, I think. And so how can you start to pilot and leverage universities as a means to trial new and potential future states for your organization? Also, to reduce risk, how can you partner with other organizations to create a consortium of research and development? And, I, and I'll, I'll just say this. One of the things we're doing uh, we, I, before I left Stanford in October of 2020 um, we actually worked with a couple of companies to bridge Stanford and th th an interest in, in, let's just say, innovation education. You know, how can how can we work in Thailand to to foster a more innovative mindset for graduate for folks who are going to be graduating? So targeting undergraduates uh, in in their um, in their academic career and and sort of working through what that looks like. And so trying to create a consortium of research partners that have a common goal with a with a common outcome that might benefit the country. So that's just that's just one way to think about it. It's difficult, however, without making sure your core business is secure to justify a large and ongoing R&D investment. Unless you're Intel and you realize you better keep making smaller and better chips and so on. I, I wonder a little bit, though, about what Intel is doing about quantum computing, because in theory, um, that, yep. that's sort of a mind for chip market. So, again, if you're not doing R&D in that space, Stanford had built, an R, built a quantum computer as a trial. They're probably not going to do much with that. But shouldn't you be checking out what's going on there? These are the sorts of things. So building connection, connect, connective tissue to great universities, to local universities, to get insights about what's happening is critical for leaders to remain successful, in my view. And, and, and um, you know, you, you work with a lot of governments, I think, uh, designing programs that benefits SMEs. And, uh, and, and you know, I was, I was a, a benefactor of, of one of those programs that, you know, when I went out to Stanford and, or Stanford University and, and, and went through a couple of programs with you guys. Um, we, you know, what, what, what do you think the role of governments should be, you know, in terms of driving this ecosystem, um, you know, building this part? I know in, in the case of Stanford, it 
was not really uh, induced by the government. But I mean, in Asia, I mean, your knowledge of how uh, uh, government plays, you know, somewhat different roles uh, in driving business and so on. Um, and, and there's an expectation also, right? A lot of SMEs are waiting for handouts and, you know, we've got different mentalities, especially in countries like Malaysia, where hey, there's a lot of, of handouts all the time uh, and there's so much dependency on, on governments. What, what are your thoughts around uh, that sort of government, business, university, yeah, so, R&D? I mean, the, the interflux of all these different uh, variables. So, so, so I think, I mean, I look about it, it's three concentric circles that are intersecting, right? This Venn diagram, there's governments, there's industry and there's university, right? And 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 actually at Stanford University, a lot of our initial uh, um, uh, af efforts were, were government funded research, frankly. Yeah. We, we've gotten away from that, but you have to remember that Stanford, in, back in the day, the government was interested in creating um, great research. They gave Stanford money to do that research and industry emerged from that. So that's why I talk about those three sort of concentric circles connecting this Venn diagram. And and, and I think you're right, Roshan, they, they have gotten farther apart. Government is no longer creating the incentives and funding. Uh, I think the, the, the one of the things that then in KL that's happening, I know, is uh, the, the sort of cyber jaya uh, kind of uh, industrial park. So creating tax free zones that's happening in the UAE that we've seen. It's happening in Le the Lille Nord region where you can really sort of um, uh, support um, the ability for entrepreneurs to get a get a get a start right so you you're, you're creating this potential investments Qatar is doing the same thing um, and, and and so trying to create these economic zones that would reduce the friction uh, the, the 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 rental what have you um, so that it, startups can can get started is something that governments can do there are no the governments now these days in the US are just looking for tax dollars local revenue um, housing and so on and so forth generated by industry and frankly industry is not relying less around here on Stanford University and Berkeley and others for research and development and they're more relying on on those universities for great students and potentially some great ideas so even that connective tissue, companies are now building education programs, Roshan, you know this very well, because you have some great content that you offer companies that, that actually benefit organizations more than the sort of university journey. So I, I think while in a place like Malaysia and Thailand and Southeast Asia, there's, there's great opportunity to work with governments to create the right incentives to in incentivize business and also foster university research that will trigger the next, you know, you'll, the one gusher or two that you might have per, per year. Yep. Uh, Ravi, sorry, I, I've been hogging the questions. Go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, uh, just uh, uh, a lot of uh, good. But really, when we talk about government research, and just to slightly go off the script a little bit is, and maybe this was a question towards the end, but um, I think there's been great work out of um, in London from Professor Mazzucato, who said that the risks that you the government can take uh, you know, the research that, you know, you'd say, if you look at the quantum, right, and there's return and risk, the ones that, you know, the government takes are the ones that, you know, nobody can actually, it costs a lot of money and you can afford to write it off, you know. I mean, the kind of risk that you took when you, you went, when men went, went to the moon, right, when the U.S. went to the moon, right. Uh, a lot of good stuff came out of that, but that's only the government can under, underwrite that kind of risk because, I mean, in the, in the worst case, you can always print your dollars to, to pay for it, right. Um, and no one else uh, has the capacity uh, to do that. Um, I, I suppose when we talk about that and you talk about Southeast Asia, and if governments were to take that kind of, of you know, what are the big moonshots uh, for in Southeast Asia, you know, where would you think those those kind of uh, areas, you know, governments can fund? Because no, no, nobody in the West may look at it because it's it's our problem, and certainly business doesn't have the money to to do that. Do you think that's a workable idea? So, I mean. You know, I thought a little bit about the sort of the, the, the moonshots uh, concept. And, you know, I have to say uh, that that um, the COVID has been a wake up call in, in a number of different ways. Um, yeah. One is that education is no longer a place based thing. You don't have to go to a campus to get educated. Right. Yep. I think one of the things that that many in Asia generally also in Southeast Asia specifically aspired to is, is to get to the United States and to a great university because then they can potentially remain in the country. 
And, um, you know, I talked to many uh, Stanford University administrators and the, the best kept secret of the Silicon Valley is that we are able to retain the great talent that comes from Southeast Asia and Asia, China, et cetera, India. We keep them in the valley and then they help generate um, the next generation of great products and services and new companies and so on because the incentives are, are here. Even and in spite of how difficult it is and how expensive it is, um, boy, the rewards are, are really, really quite, quite nice. You know, the moonshot. What if uh, Asia could build the next MIT in Stanford, given all the brilliant talent that's there, right, that, that exists, that we've met, bright, engaging, uh, targeting that market? Forget about coming to Stanford. What if we could go to, you know, KL University, I don't know, world, baby. So, so starting to invest in in uh, re research and development capacity that will lead to amazing future generations you you have the people that i've met i've been completely inspired uh, singapore thailand vietnam malaysia it, it, it's just amazing the youthful energy that's there the, the the regret i think as i look at the big scene is is the the exit of the best talent and how can you start to retain that talent and and, and create local companies and and create that sort of uh, fantastic university that would be a, like a Stanford or MIT or Berkeley and so on. That 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 could be a potentially amazing moonshot, right? For, I think. For, I think. I think. Generations. Uh, uh, yeah, I I think the guys who have already thought of that are the guys in Singapore EPU. They've already thought of that and they're pushing NUS NTU. Yeah. And, 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 uh, and you can I, see. I, I, uh, yeah. You can already see the the results of it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, we're going to we're going to take a short break, but I got a couple of comments from David that I want to highlight. Uh, and he's got a very interesting question. Um, so I, let me go to comments. I think back in the day, uh, there were specific deal flows to certain professors with certain VCs. Well, according to Paul Graham and Jace, uh, Jason and Peter Thiel mentioned that uh, um, it's just a ripple effect. Uh, it's just that nobody's doing the long-term ripple effects to the capital banking sectors when we blew the two six hundred million for ten twelve deals and expect one through and um, um, so so you know his question I think and, and this is a cheeky one I think um, uh, is um, you know uh, hold on a second did I get that right okay sorry I I'm, I'm going to the previous comment he says I would like to get Paul's thoughts on the god of spec Chamat's position on Silicon Valley being a Ponzi scheme for the bigger boys, <laughs> i.e. 40, 40 cents to that dollar. Um, and his, uh, or Michael Seals comment two months ago on the lies YC feeds to TechCrunch and other media PR in the land of God startup. Um, you know, again, very, you know, if you want to make a comment and then we're going to take a quick break right after this. <laughs> I mean, I, sure. Right. I mean, so I think... Um, that 0.25 trillion wants to grow, uh, right? Those are the, that's the VC. And and is there a lot of hype in the in this area? Absolutely, absolutely. They're they're really good ideas that don't get funding, and then really sort of fairly average ideas that get amazing funding and then become publicly traded companies. And and you know what? I think there's there is a little bit of that going on almost in every environment that I've ever seen. I think the question is, um, you know. If you think about it, who, who, how many people remember MySpace, right? Yeah. Okay, so MySpace was first, it got a lot of hype, it wasn't that good, and then Facebook came along, and guess what? They really did well, although they're evil, right? Well, some might argue. So, so you have to think a little bit about what, 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 and 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 there'll be the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. So I think part of it is is um, Yes, there is a there's a huge hype cycle on this, and and, uh, and and then you have to make evaluation whether and how these services products that emerge are, are useful or not, and the yield is probably um, still making money for most of the people that are in in the mix. So anyway, that's a maybe a quick answer to before we get to your break. Fantastic. So we'll, we'll take a quick break. We're going to go to Africa and uh, we're going to learn some pigeon English. Uh, Michael, who is uh, who's uh, playing around with Nicole in Africa. So let's take a quick short 30 second break. We'll be right back here with Paul Marker, formerly from Stanford University and Ravi Ratnam from Sage Tree Capital. Why I found out? Oh, my just gentle guy. I just discovered this new learning platform to call Nicole. Man, not a real deal. I tell you, man, I just pay only 50 US dollars for one subscription. And my life don't change. I don't use that damn job for this one. I tell you so. You don't believe me? I did tell you. I've been saying you didn't catch up on this call, guy. You remember when I tell you say to the learn eight hours a day for class? They tell me this is the real solution for me right now because I did learn in bite sizes at my own time, any place, anywhere where I want to learn. And if you get content across the board, oh boy, no be no be prepared. I did tell you now the real deal with this. 
Okay, no worry, I go send you the link, no worry, I go send you the link. Omo, we could talk later, I want the link to the group. Yeah? I go to Nicole, I don't tell you now, I don't tell you, go sign up, we don't waste time more. The link na uh, digitaldramatics.org. Okay, we go chat later, right? Okay, I'll go back, bye bye. Omo, this is Nicole, the deal, oh boy. I'm going to go to go. No easy, no easy. Welcome back to Rethinking Balance Sheets. We're here with Paul Makra, uh, formerly just retired from Stanford University. Now he's part of uh, our setup at the Round Mix and also does a lot of consulting and a lot of strategic work all over the world. Um, we just saw Nicole in Africa. So if you haven't signed up for your own personal Nicole, go to Nicole.app and get it. You know, David sort of apologizes to you, Paul. So he says, sorry for being cheeky there. Uh, we rarely get someone from Stanford here. I had to, you know, you guys are awesome as all. So there you go, David. Don't worry. The questions can keep rolling. Uh, we've got guests from all over. You know, today we've got uh, even Zahida from Pakistan who's joining us. So Zahida, welcome to the show. And as always, uh, our show is about looking at the balance sheets and finding interesting ways to tweak it to our benefit or to enhance it um, and to explore different aspects of the balance sheet. Joining me is Ravi Ramaratnam. Ravi, um, you know, we've been talking to Paul about Stanford University and that gold mine that was created in um, in Silicon, you know, we call Silicon Valley. Um, I think, Paul, one of the things um, we, we, we sort of are trying to grapple with is how do we I, and you, you spoke about this a bit, you know, uh, how do we replicate uh, some of this out here with a couple of ideas, but in a practical sum, terms for businesses, right? And, and businesses need R&D, right? To funnel their growth, to funnel future uh, endeavors and so on. Um, what are practical advice that you can impart to businesses in terms of enabling or investing or um, especially in these tight times, right? Where money is re relatively tight to, to really ensuring that R&D is part of their ecosystem. I mean, I think for first is sort of, you know, obviously create a strategy that would would take advantage of this. So you, you, one assumption is that you need R&D. Um, the question then becomes, do you build versus buy? Right. I mean, you can go to great universities around the globe and and, and enter into what they call a sort of uh, affiliates programs. Stanford had many, um, the, the most productive of which is called the the computer form, which is run out of the, the Department of Computer Science. Um, it was wonderful way you engage um, at, at some annual fee, let's just call it 10 to 50,000 US dollars. You have an opportunity to uh, get um, briefings from faculty. You get a chance to meet some of the students. There used to be an opportunity to come to campus to listen to the quarterly briefing that um, not sure where that stands right now, especially given uh, the surge in various places of, in around the world. Um, but but this is a lightweight way to get exposure. Um, then you can step it up. Many universities have the opportunity to conduct research on a on a sort of sponsored research basis. You can work sp with specific faculty. Again, this, you're buying the access. Um, if you really want to build research capacity, that does take some time and effort, and it also will. Um, maybe the yield is not one in 10 to one in 40 uh, in terms of, a, of an oil gusher, but rather, uh, you, you know, maybe you could focus effort and attention to, to what I would call applied research rather than fundamental research. The difference is important. Fundamental research is, you know, what are the properties of, of, of the next uh, physics particle? And how can I explore that? That's fundamental research versus applied research, which is how can I learn more using, using data science and data analytics? It's also important to understand the motivations of faculty. Faculty want to publish. Businesses want to make progress. So if you actually engage with a, the with a university, they're going to want to publish whatever happens. <laughs> and, and so you need to make sure that if you're buying the service uh, versus building the service, you, there are some terms and conditions um, that you have to, have to honor. But I, I think a good uh, organization who has some capital and some core business spinning off some residual cash will start to look at research and development adjacent to that core operation, typically, to us to start. And then for getting further and further afield as, as the research and development uh, sort of pays off. Uh, medical device industry is a classic example of, of creating, uh, you know, a stent and then a drug eluding stent and then additional research on the ways in which that, that interacts with the body and, and so on and so forth. So. Uh, just Paul, I think, you know, I like this oil analogy that you said and the gusher thing. It's done 
at very large scale, right? But you know, when when you got the dollars for just one shot, how do you de-risk it? You know, in the oil industry, even the big boys, you know, they you know BP goes in with Exxon um, or you know Total and and they drill a well. They don't take all the risk themselves. Is there a model? I know you've done. They've done it for very large, uh, you know, defense projects. You know, you got several companies working on it. But is there a smaller scale model that someone can come up? I mean, you're doing a lot of consulting around, you know, design, etc. But you know, when you got limited dollars, is there a cleverer way to do this? I mean, yeah, I, I think. So again, a couple of ideas come to mind. One is we built, a, you know, comp we got three to four companies in Thailand to cooperate to well create done. research funds um, around very general areas where faculty members were interested. One of them was um, artificial intelligence and an aging population. So there were three right. companies really interested in this. And so they, they funded research activity around that um, to sort of think about what happens? Um, how do you house? W w what are the underlying technologies that are being used in order to, to benefit from uh, looking at aged population and artificial intelligence? How can you evaluate um, that opportunity relative to the housing and the structure? And, and what are the medical implications for that? So we had facilities uh, research, business school research, we had medical school research, all in the context of, of this one, this sort of three companies funding this, this initiative. So that was kind of exciting work that we were doing. Um, again, I mentioned the education innovation. So, so partnering with with uh, uh, like-minded but um, adjacent uh, companies in terms of industry, so you're not you know have com competitors in the same space, right? So that's one way. The second is, you know, work again. Probably don't build it because you're going to need a bunch mm -hmm. of PhDs to to run something like this. Um, but but can you work closely with with trusted universities? One of the things that surprised me is actually. Additive research to existing faculty um, is not that expensive, even at Stanford. Um, so, and the yield is, is pretty good. So you'd be surprised what you can get done with the pool of money. But, but I think sort of doing the shopping, identifying the right faculty member and right university for you and your organization in the, in the specific domain, that takes a little bit of work. So right. go to conferences, take a look at what's happening, get to know people, use the network. The, the, this is, if no other time, get on LinkedIn, figure out who's doing what, try to build connections, and just ask the consistent question about the uh, area or domain you're interested in exploring. Tremendous. I mean, that's I, like yeah. I, I take it from where you left it. The pandemic has changed the way we think. That that's that's one thing um, that's that's a given now. I think. Sorry, Roshan. Yeah. Yeah. No. I no. I did, I did. Yeah. We wouldn't Go be ahead, having Paul. this conversation for were it not for the pandemic. Absolutely. I, <laughs> I wouldn't have reached out to Roshan. Uh, what the heck are you doing? How can I help? Right. We would. I mean, and so the the world, in some sense, in my view, has gotten a hell of a lot smaller. Absolutely. Right? Because, because though we it, can't get on jet planes, though. Yep. That's okay. <laughs> That's, uh, but we I are. We are. Uh, missed you yeah. We're, tra we're yeah, traveling no. at the speed of light because we are right. on the internet is at the speed of light, faster than a jet plane. <laughs> exactly. I, I, I yeah. miss uh, the JW and KL, but anyway. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, after my own home, when I'm done, I go to sleep, you know. So. Yeah, the, the, the only one we are missing is the food being the, the transporter in Star Trek, right? Um, and who Uber knows, Eats. 3D might make that happen. <laughs> Uber Eats. Uh, yeah. So, so you know, uh, again, I, I'm just going to highlight a couple more comments. You know, there's a bunch of comments. Uh, David, especially, is, uh, I think he's pretty animated, you know. And and I think this is a fair comment. I, I think on a serious note, you know, we got to be real, guys. We're not talking apples and oranges. The US and Malaysia, you know, whether the startup scene in Malaysia or the university scene in Malaysia um, is different because of IP policies. And, and, and he adds, you know, the university R&D acts, the insurance safety nets. It doesn't exist in Malaysia. And, and likewise, you know, on the, on the VC models, um, uh, at very early university research levels also don't exist. Um, and, and the second uh, comment, I think he says, secondly, the research is clear. IP and patents is not inclusive. There's inequality built in to now. Uh, there's patent trolls, there's uh, trolls, there's a uh, dominion of large research libraries and, 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 and other things. Um, and, you know, I mean, that's fair. I think it's a fair comment. Um, I, I mean, your quick reactions, Ravi or, or uh, uh, Paul, to, to some of the things that he says is, uh, you know, two very different uh, uh, sort of, uh, spheres um, and and uh, and uh, 
and even the government systems, right? Uh, as he adds, uh, your thoughts, guys. Well, I think uh, it's a it's a long one. It's probably going to be a discussion that would go on forever if you if you really got into it. It's uh, probably not in a show of this yep. kind. Um, sure. Yeah, and then and it's really big policy decisions uh, and shifts that we have to make. I think, and these things don't happen overnight. Uh, you know, uh, certainly when Singapore, you know, when I went to university uh, NUS, it was, at least for non-Malay, it was easier to get into uh, NUS than University of Malaya. Today, to get into NUS, it's incredibly difficult, yeah? It's incredibly difficult, yeah? Um, and so, but I think there's, you know, a commitment which took a long, long time uh, which uh, which Singapore made and to get to this level, uh, and that that needs you know, you know, like I said, a, a whole another discussion uh, before we can even begin to talk about things like. That. So I think the real focus today is very much on what we can do as a business here or what as individuals we can do. Absolutely, and and that's what Paul's been opening up on it. And, yeah, and we rightly pointed out the internet is there, uh, and if there are clever ideas, how do we de-risk a project? Uh, from a business perspective, get three or four people together. Hey, these are things that we can start exploring. We don't have to wait, you know, uh, for the 12th Malaysia plan and, you know, uh, uh, a decision in parliament and cabinet and so forth. Uh, as business people, we can do something about it. Yep, yep. Um, I mean, so, so my quick reaction is, David, thank you for keeping us honest. And uh, <laughs> I, I love that. I, I think you, you, you bring out a sort of IP policy is, is important. And, um, you know, business model and throughput is, is maybe more, more critical. Uh, I mean, if you look at Grab, right, that Grab was in Malaysia started the organization. Why did it go to Singapore? Because the Singapore government offered them a better deal, right? So that, that they lose, you lose that, um, maybe a bigger market, perhaps, perhaps not, don't know. But I mean, so I think one of the things is is not only what are the IP rules and regulations so you can protect the, the organization, but but how fast are you moving in terms of a business model? Because I think really good ideas will be copied. I think, you know, sort of the IP only goes so far in terms of that. You can maybe maybe, maybe argue in the courts and so on. But I, I think if you can start to scale business models and, and think about the go to market strategy as a means to, to create a competitive advantage, uh, all the better. So you know, I I I, uh, I guess you know, kind of kind of wrapping it uh, slowly up. You know, um, do you see uh, sort of a role for localizations of uh, certain aspects of research? Um, you know, and then and then maybe humming, humming it down to Southeast Asia or Malaysia or, or some of the vicinity as you have seen. Um, and and do you see um, a lot more U.S. universities coming out to the region? Uh, we we seen a, a huge influx of the U.K. universities and Australian universities come out. Um, but do you see a role for some of the top 10 universities um, in, in, in the U.S. that uh, may potentially have collaborations out here in, the, in Malaysia uh, for the Southeast Asia market? So I think uh, this sort of localization uh, dimension, I, I, I think is sort of interesting, right? I mean, I, I believe that... Um, so one of the, one of the well-kept secrets, I mean, the Stanford Center for Professional Development, We've been connected with industry since 1969. Why? Because it's an engineering-based um, uh, Silicon Valley ecosystem. And the engineering companies had talent, and the talent was slowing down and not being as productive because they didn't have the latest cutting-edge stuff. So they came to Stanford. Uh, you know, sort of Frederick Terman, the father of Silicon Valley, made a deal with four companies, um, four big companies, and uh, Lockheed, Sylvania, General Electric, and one other who I can't remember right now, but there's a book on it. And what they did was they negotiated a way to provide education for those bright and promising engineers so they could remain vital. One of the things that, that you know, one opportunity I see is bridging in Malaysia and Southeast Asia, governments and companies to universities. You don't have to do an applied degree. This is not vocational education but you should consider the opportunities to connect with those companies to see if you could meet their needs. And, and by, by creating the dialogue, which I've been advocating through my association with the International Association for Continuing Engineering Education, uh, strong connections in Malaysia, um, you know, there is an opportunity to at least have the conversation about the needs of these various three parties, government, industry, and university. I think it's fostering that dialogue and, and being much more aggressive than some other companies could countries could be an opportunity for Malaysia. With regard to Stanford connecting uh, or, or other universities connecting 
to S Southeast Asia. Once again, Ravi, the, the notion of the COVID changing the game is significant here. Yeah. You can take a degree and you can be anywhere in the world. Something I've been delivering for, for through SCPD, our organization delivered that well before COVID and now it's here. And so I think what you'll start to see is the opportunity for universities to offer a blended learning experience. That is some synchronous learning as we're doing here. Um, there'll be some activity that is asynchronous learning where it's uh, on Memorex on, on your video streaming. And then there'll be some in-person experience either at the home campus or in country that will afford this connective activity along with community layer, which is really, really important. So I think those four dimensions are the future of, of education, and it is not place-based. You don't have to have a bunch of buildings to do this. As you said, Ravi, we, we're, doing, we're working at the speed of light here. Yep. So think about, think about the learning journey as, as, imp, as important to architect, and, and the, the where is less important, right? So I think those are, those are some ideas that, that I see sort of uh, surfacing in, in, in my experience uh, with regard to the sort of that means that any university can come, then it's, it's, it's contingent upon whether the university wants to engage. And that's a different yeah. story. Yeah. And I think you could, you got it spot on and, and, and you got it right at the three levels. The one is interactive on the internet. Obviously you learn on your own uh, on the, this one, but the point that people forget is that community thing, because I myself, uh, I, and we can talk about that later, but that's the third part. And, on that community thing, if you ask me if, if we have one advantage, uh, and you've been to KL, we're friendly people, we've got great food. Uh, so that part of that aspect, I think we, we got a chance to win it. I mean, I think you're absolutely right. And, 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 and the, the great the great thing, about, and I think that sort of third leg of the stool, that community, yeah. Uh, yeah. asynchronous or synchronous online, some, some yeah. Experiential activity to activate the learning, and then some community building before, during, and after. And the after yeah. part is where you, the universities like Stanford do a really good job, and other organizations don't do as good a job relative to uh, that community building. That is really this, I would call it the third leg or the third rail, depending upon your perspective. <laughs> and, 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 and you know, I, th I think Paul, you hit, uh, you hit it on the nail. I mean, David, David sort of uh, uh, continues to say, I believe Southeast Asia can undertake a more transformative path towards a more peaceful, unified global citizenship for all. But we need to make some better policy changes and, and stronger regional integration plans. Um, and also starting by getting the young at the center of the discussion, transforming academic entrepreneurship through innovative transformative processes. And, and I think, I think one, one of the points you made, um, you know, you talked about networks somewhat. Um, you know, because of what has happened with the pandemics, the networks become important and all of us can access them. I mean, and I think for us at Eromics, one of the things we are trying to do is build Nicole as a network uh, where we can bring so many people with diverse skills in a very closed platform. And if you think about LinkedIn, if LinkedIn had like a thousand people on it, it would not be a very good product. Um, it is because it has millions and millions in there and you get to extract the benefit. And I think today we are in this global playing field where we are part of many, many different networks that may be even more powerful than governments to some extent. And I think governments become, um, you know, tax collectors, right? It's, so the position of governments, like how do I make it into a Bali or a, or a KL is so exciting for people to come because of the food and other things. And, and uh, ultimately it's, it's not relevant anymore uh, yeah. places, but it's really about... I, I do have one comment that uh, David met, mentioned this sort of innovation entrepreneurship, right? Sort of academic entrepreneurship through innovation transformation. So to me, innovation and entrepreneurship are two sides of the same coin. And um, you will, you, you, to, to be an entrepreneur, you don't necessarily need to have the aspirations to found a company, but you better be thinking about how to take a good idea to market. And, and similarly, you, you need a good idea in order to be a successful entrepreneur. And, and I think training that as foundational is, is absolutely critical, something that we were taking uh, on the road. Uh, and, and as you know, Roshan, you experienced one of our programs. Th these are really, really important uh, basic principles to so that uh, countries um, like Malaysia and others can start to, to really accelerate the growth. It's no longer about getting a governmental job or an org a, comp a company job for 40 years. It's about remaining flexible, even while you're in that job, thinking about the next opportunity as an entrepreneur and an innovator of your own career. 
Fantastic. So Ravi, you know, your, your sort of final thoughts as we wrap up the show has been such an exciting, you know, I, I didn't realize, you know, 45 minutes just gone by just like that. Um, you know, sort of your key takeaways, Ravi, from uh, some of the ideas and insights that uh, Paul wow. has shared with us. I think uh, we can say key takeaways will be the right word. And I'm, I'm always um, thinking of three things, the bow tie, the oil well, and the pandemic. Um, the, the bow tie is, is useful because I think it was well explained where, what really the VC is doing. I think that's, that's a very simple uh, explanation of how that was done um, and what they, they see, they're linking the two together. The oil well, yep, that's uh, the gush and, and we talked a little bit about de-risking even. Um, that's something that's really got to be thought through because that, that's if you want to take it down to smaller companies, how do we de-risk the, the bets we make on R&D? And and COVID and, and, and you know, uh, the third part of you know, how you could even talk to major universities, this has changed the world. Um, you don't have to go down to, I mean, if you, if you want to talk about AI, it's not necessary to go down and, and talk to University of Malaya, which is just three miles down the road. Um, th there's an opportunity to talk to a Stanford of MIT. And that's, that's a realization at, at University of Malaya that they need to make uh, if they want to get into the game. Uh, people are no longer going to have it, a problem uh, talking to somebody in Stanford or NUS or NTU. Um, it's just going to be just just as easy as going down to the sun. But there's still that community uh, part, uh, and they got to make that work to their advantage. Thanks, Ravi. And, and, you know, Paul, just to wrap it up, uh, you know, I, I just want, do want to shout out to David because, I mean, he has continuously uh, uh, loaded us with a whole bunch of comments. So, David, thank you so much and uh, um, appreciate you being around. And uh, he's also saying that, uh, I, I think he's, he's saying I agree 100%. So, I mean, he's, he's uh, and, and he's thanking all of us for uh, being here. Um, but, you know, Paul, as we wrap this up, right, um, you know, if you could leave us with your final thoughts, your pieces of advice, your nuggets of wisdom that you want to impart to our viewers as we wrap this up uh, and as we close out this kind of discussion, um, what would your sort of nuggets of wisdom be to each and every one of us? Well, I mean, I think, first of all, you, you know, in Malaysia, you have an amazing opportunity, even in spite of some of the challenges. Um, and I also wish the country very well with regard to uh, the challenges around COVID. And that goes for all your the audience. Um, I, I do think that um, with the youth and the energy and the friendliness and the great food, there's an amazing opportunity in in, uh, in Southeast Asia generally and in Malaysia specifically. So excited about uh, being a part of Leadernomics and seeing where that goes and how I can help. I, I do think that um, this light, this notion of lifelong learning is really critical. Um, it's not only the case that, that the youth need to be educated around innovation and entrepreneurship so that they can adapt and adjust to an increasingly complex environment, but it's also the case that um, learning uh, for a new career or for reskilling the current career it will be absolutely critical for the future generations. So learning how to learn will be, will be really critical. And um, again, in concert of governments thinking uh, more holistically about uh, the lifelong journey, uh, companies considering ways to, to generate and keep the best talent, and then universities working as really the glue between those, those two entities uh, for, for the period of university, as well as for the lifelong uh, need for, for learning. Thank you, Paul. And, you know, for, uh, you know, as we, as we wrap up this show, you know, I, I, I just do a final kind of call out that, you know, if you haven't got your or copy of Nicole uh, or access to Nicole, you know, go down to Nicole.app uh, and make sure you get your access to Nicole. So we, with that, you know, uh, as we, as we wrap up this show, um, I, I, you know, I, I, again, you know, just, Totally overwhelmed with so many insights, Paul. I really appreciate uh, uh, the, 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 the kind of insights that you've given us um, and the simplicity in communicating that, you know, uh, uh, says a lot. You know, I, I just want to close up with a couple more comments, you know, from, from different people, uh, you know, that, that are, that are kind of saying, hey, you know, well done. Uh, lots of hand raising and clapping going on. Thank you so much, guys. You know, next week we are going to have a special episode uh, where we're going to wrap up uh, this series. So we're going to finish our season. Uh, we'll close out the 2021 season. We've had 30 episodes. So the finale is next week, uh, episode number 30 for the 2021 season of Rethinking Balance Sheet. So Ravi, I can't believe we've been talking for 30 weeks 
um, on, on, on the balance sheet. I mean, uh, a topic that most people will say, ah, you know. I'd rather <laughs> watch them... paint dry. Yeah, I'd rather watch paint dry. <laughs> give, them, give, them, give them two weeks, you know. They'll, they'll, they'll go dry, you know. It's 30 weeks. Uh, we wrap up season one next week. Uh, it's going to be uh, an exciting I... episode. We will uh, be bringing different people in and uh, we will be having our season finale as we close out the season and as we plan for the 2022 season. So, Ravi, um, your final exciting uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, goodbyes as we as we wrap up this episode and as we look forward to the last episode of this final season uh, or this this final uh, episode of this season for rethinking balance sheet uh, i think it's i think as you know it's been a tremendous journey we've learned so much today's paul is just one more even last week i think solera's uh, when she spoke at least gave us you know there was definitely hope that we are going in the right direction uh, there's tremendous resources like Paul around the world uh, that we can tap on and should tap on. Uh, we don't know everything. Uh, and as much as, uh, you know, I think that's the key thing. I see Ray Dalio is always talking about this. You know, what is it that you don't know? Uh, not that you know everything. Um, and that's, and if, if we take a humble approach, yeah, uh, I think we can achieve amazing things. All right, so that's us signing out for today. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you again for your time and your availability and for the insights and for you know the, the, the knowledge of Reservoir that you've been uh, willingly sharing with us. So with that, uh, goodbye, everyone. Have a super Friday. Have a super weekend for Paul. He has uh, one more, uh, a couple more hours before you can get to TGIF, but uh, uh, you, you'll get there, Paul. So <laughs> uh, wishing everyone a happy weekend and a blessed Friday to all. Goodbye, everyone. We'll see you guys next week. Same time, same place. Bye.